talk about the issue of the bride of Christ, uh, or so-called. Let me get the timer here going. It means virtually very little, but uh, <laughs> we're going to try and get through as much as we can. We have a lot to cover, so without uh, further ado, let's, let's jump in here. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 9. Um, I also want to just express a, an appreciation uh, to Brother uh, Jordan and, and Grace School of the Bible for the opportunity uh, to speak with you here this afternoon, and it's always a joy, and there's always so many wonderful things about this conference, but uh, I can go on and on about that, and let's just enjoy the study uh, for now. Revelation 21 verse 9. And here John writes, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together to study your word, and uh, with ready minds and, and, and ready hearts to, uh, to look at these things that, that you have uh, communicated uh, to us for our edification, for our understanding, that we can, uh, having our, our understanding enlightened, that we can understand your eternal uh, purpose for heaven and earth uh, and, and fully appreciate that, uh, your plan for the earth and, and, and your plan for the, for the heavenly places, and that we could see that here in, in Revelation 21, that culmination there, and understand what's going on in these passages. And we thank you for your, for your, uh, for your son who loved us and gave himself for us, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Here, Revelation 21, in verse 9, verse 10 there, you see John talking about this bride. And this is the passage where we get the term, the idea of the bride of Christ. Now, Richard had mentioned a moment, you know, a little earlier today, that the, the term, the bride of Christ, is not in, in the Bible. It's not a doctrinal uh, term. It's not a scriptural term. The doctrine associated with it, we understand what that's about. I may refer to the bride as the, the bride or the bride of Christ, I'd rather refer to it as the Lamb's wife because that's what it's talked about in Scripture. The, the idea of the, the bride of Christ, you understand when you say the bride of Christ or when Christianity talks about uh, the, the bride of Christ, we are the bride and so on, and they use terminology like that, what they're describing is a status. And see, no one, th this passage is not communicating a status. Rather, it's communicating a figure of speech, a, a word picture, if you will, to describe a relationship that Jehovah God is going to have with this bride, Okay. Now, in verse 10 there, or verse 9, he, he goes on, he says, uh, Come hither, the end of verse 9, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. Obviously, there's, there's the, you, we see the lamb and we see the, the wife. Notice the bride is a wife, and we're going to touch on that in a moment. This is describing a marriage, obviously. This marriage, what is a, what is a marriage? A marriage is a, a loving union. A, a faithful relationship, never to be separated. Now, just to identify a couple of things right out the gate here, he says there at the end of at verse 9, I will show you the Lamb's wife. Now, that's not hard to identify. If you will, come with me to the book of John, John chapter 1. Now, my, my goal for, for this afternoon is to do three things. One is identify the bride. It's very simple. It's very clear in Scripture. Identify who the bride is. Secondly, uh, explain what's going on in Revelation 21 when he talks about the city and the details of that city. And then thirdly, I want to demonstrate and talk about where the body of Christ fits in with all of this. Many people, most of Christianity, unfortunately, um, they fail to rightly divide the scriptures and they confuse different passages, and this is one of them. And what we recognize, what, we're, what, what, they'll, what they'll identify is the church today is the bride. And I'm going to tell you right now that the church, the body of Christ, is not the bride of Christ. It's never referred to the bride of Christ, and we'll deal with some of those passages. Um, John, I told you the book of John, and here I am in, in Luke. That won't do. John chapter 1, some verses you're familiar with, I'm sure. If, you, if you're not, you ought to be. Um, John chapter 1, verse 29. Here we see the Lord come on the scene in, in, in John, John's baptism here. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. If you come down to verse 36, he says, And looking upon Jesus, as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. So it's very simple and very clear. We know who the Lamb is, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the one who's going to, is participating in this marriage, obviously. Now, if you will, come with me to... Back to Revelation 21, 
Actually, you know what? Forget that. Let's just jump into it. We don't have time for that. Uh, <laughs> Isaiah 54. Let's just jump into it. Let's identify the bride. It's, it's a simple matter. What I, wanted to, what I wanted to point out to you here in, in Revelation is that what you're seeing in Revelation is not a... The point, the point in Revelation 21 is not to demonstrate something new occurring, but rather to explain something that's, that's being fulfilled that was already talked about in prophecy. Now, this all makes sense as we, as we progress. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5. Now, notice what, what God says about, about the bride, and we're going to see it throughout prophecy in a number of passages, and he identifies it for us very simply. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 5. Uh, for thy maker... Now he's talking to Israel here. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth, when thou hast refused, saith thy God. So in verse 6 there, uh, who is the wife of youth and who is that bride? It's Israel. Very clear, very simple. If you will, come with me to Jeremiah chapter 31. As we go through these passages, what, you'll see that, what, what you will see going on in the book of Revelation is a culmination and, and, and a climactic point of this marriage taking place, but it's a fulfillment of something that was already talked about. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31. Now here in this passage, he's talking about the new covenant and the details of the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, and notice, notice when God married the nation Israel. What you'll find out here is that there was a time, a point in time, where God married the nation. There was a point in time where he divorced the nation and that he promised a remarriage, and that's what you see in Revelation 21, a remarriage, and you'll see the purpose of that marriage, okay? So here in Revelation, uh, Jeremiah 31, rather, verse 31, Talking about the new covenant, he says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. So at that point, and with, while, while I'm explaining this, come with me to Exodus 34. When, he t when, when the nation is, is born and it comes out, come out of the, the land of Egypt, he makes a marriage covenant. Malachi chapter 2, Joel 2 talks about this covenant of marriage, that he makes a marriage covenant with the nation Israel. Exodus chapter 34. The other thing I want you to just think about as we, as we go on is that marriage takes place when he takes them out of Egypt and he's going to bring them into their promised land. So here in Exodus 34, notice the, the warning that he gives them. Exodus chapter 34 and verse 10. Now here, this is when Moses, you remember the account where he destroys the first, the first law there, the Ten Commandments, he destroys that and he's got to make a copy. Well, this is the context there. And he sees the glory of God, the glory of Jehovah. Now verse 10, and he said, I make a covenant before all thy people, I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art uh, shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorites, and the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hevite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whether thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. So he warns them, don't fraternize and don't make covenants and, and confederacies with these Gentile nations in the land. You are to drive them out, and that's what you see in the book of Joshua. You're to drive them out, destroy them, and have no part of, of, of their, their culture, their religions, and so on, and their gods. Now, verse, uh, verse 13, But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. Those are the places of, their, of the, the pagan uh, worship. For thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous god. I'm married to my wife. I am a jealous husband. Very jealous. I've got a wonderful wife. You understand that. About my wife and your spouse, that's what I meant. But What he's talking about there, jealous, is you'll have no other god before me. I'm the only one. 
So he enters into this marriage relationship with the nation, has this covenant with them, and warns them that as I bring you into the land, that promised land, you're not to, again, uh, uh, assimilate and, and, and befriend these, these pagan nations, uh, rather destroy them, take them out of the land, and break down their, the, the tools and the resources and the places of their worship. Now, that becomes the source of their, their rebellion. That becomes a, an issue there. Come with me to Jeremiah chapter 3. We know throughout Israel's history that God gave them the laws, the statutes, the commandments, his judgments, and he warns them, if you break them, then there will be punishment. There will be, you know, the if-then in principle. If you break my law, if you break my statutes, if you break my judgments, then I will bring cursing. If you obey, I will provide blessing. Now, here in Jeremiah chapter 3, he's going to give a history of, uh, of concerning Samaria, concerning uh, Israel, the ten tribes there. What happens is Israel rebels against God. They don't walk in his statutes. They don't walk in his judgments. And throughout their history, that, that, um, their rebellion grows and increases. And so do the curses and the, and the judgments. Now, Jeremiah chapter 3, notice what, notice what the Lord says here concerning Israel. He's, he's giving a warning to Judah and talking about Judah, but he, he describes something going on here with Israel, the, the two tribes. They've been separated, and we'll see the divorce and why God divorced the nation Israel. Uh, verse 1, Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 1. They say, if a man put away his wife and she go from him and become another man's, shall he return unto her again? Shall not the land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Lift up thine eyes unto the high places and see uh, where thou hast uh, not been lying with. In the ways hast thou sat uh, for them as the Arabian in the wilderness. Thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. Therefore, the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain, and thou hast a whore's forehead, thou refused to be ashamed. Wilt thou uh, not from this time cry unto me, my father, thou art the guide of my youth? Will he reserve his anger forever? Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldst. The Lord also, uh, said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She is gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree and hath played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me. And she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Now, verse 8, and I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. Now, what I want you to notice in those passages is he talks about the marriage relationship that he has with the nation Israel and that there came a point in time because of their idolatry and because of spiritual adultery that he puts them away. He divorces the nation. There was a point in time, and this is going to be, this point in time happens to be when they are taken captive by the Assyrians. Uh, notice when this divorce takes place there. Come with me to... 2 Kings 17. Hang on to Jeremiah and notice 2 Kings chapter 17. He divorces them, and that divorce takes place when, the, when Baal worship is instituted in the nation uh, of Israel there. 2 Kings and verse 17. Now, I, I know I'm going through a lot of passages, and we're doing that for a number of reasons, sake of time and so on. We've got a lot to cover. If you're taking notes, write this down. From the, from the chapters in 2 Kings chapter 14 all the way through chapter 18 is when the book of Hosea was written. And we're going to turn there in a moment. 2 Kings chapter 14 all the way through 18 covers the time in, in the kings of Judah and Israel, talking about Jeroboam, the, the, the second one, and so on, when he reigns in Israel and when that a captivity, that Assyrian captivity takes place, okay? And here's where you are in 2 second, second Kings chapter 17. That'll mean something more relevant in a, in a moment. 2 Kings chapter 17, and notice... Verse 6, in the ninth year of Hosea, the king of, of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away into Assyria and placed them in, in Halah and in uh, Habor by the river of, of Gozan in the cities of the Medes. 
For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them out of the land of Egypt. Now remember, that was the time when he married them. From under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and feared other gods, and had walked in the statutes of the heathen, from the Lord, uh, whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel and of the kings of Israel, which they had made. And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. And they built them high places in all their cities, from the tower of the watchmen to the fence city. And they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. Do you remember what we read back there in Exodus 34, where he says, destroy those things? And what we find when they were to, to drive the inhabitants of that land out, they didn't destroy them all. And that, that influence was still in their land. Now you continue reading here, verse, 10, uh, verse 11. And there they burnt incense, and in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them, and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols, whereof the Lord had said unto them, Ye shall not do this thing. Now, in the book of First Kings, we know that we see in, the, in Israel's history, the northern tribes, the ten tribes, are separated. That kingdom is divided, and they're separated. So you have Judah and Benjamin, and they're separate from the northern ten tribes, Israel and, and Samaria, that landmass of Samaria. They are taken into cap that, that division is, happens. Second, uh, First Kings chapter 12 and 13 there, we see Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, establish Baal worship as their religion. And remember, he makes the two calves, and he, he sets up a counterfeit system of Israel's, uh, the, the Jews' religion, Israel's religion, because he doesn't want his people from the north coming down to the south, worshiping in, in Bethlehem and so on, uh, in Judah. And so he sets up a counterfeit system. And this here, he's giving that account of their history. Notice verse 17, verse 16, uh, 2 Kings 7, uh, 17, 16. As he continues here, and they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worshiped all the host of heaven and served who? Baal. See, that, that's been going on since, since the beginning. Moses comes down, and he has the two ta tablets of stone, and, and who, who are they worshiping? That golden calf. You know who that golden calf represents? Is that Satan himself? They're committing spiritual adultery as a nation on the Lord with Baal. Now, notice verse 17 here. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and used divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. He put them away. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. Now we'll stop there for time's sake. You should read, if you continue reading there, he gives you some more information. But you see, child sacrifices, the groves, the high places, all, all, I mean, just perverse, dark things. But when you read passages like Jeremiah 3, 2 Kings 17 and so on, you see, you see a lot of spiritual wickedness because what they're really worshiping, they're worshiping in the name of God they're worshiping Baal. It's very perverse. Now, there's actually a couple verses here in the chapter I'd like to point out. Um, but it escapes me at the moment. Read down the passage. It'll, it'll benefit you. For now, it, we'll continue. Now, I said keep your hand there in Jeremiah chapter 3. Let's turn there again. Jeremiah chapter 3. So he marries the nation when he takes them out of the land of Egypt and brings them into their land, the land that he promised Abraham. He divorces them when they pollute the land and they serve Baal and they, they're doing all their idolatry. And when, when they do that, it gets to a point where God says, I'm going to put you away. And they're taken away into captivity by Assyria and, and so on and so forth. Now, notice Jeremiah chapter 3 and just a few things there in verse 1. God doesn't just divorce his people and then there's no promise of, of, of restoration. And this is where it becomes very important because a lot of Christianity will say Israel in the Old Testament was God's wife. He divorced them. And so that the church and the church age today is that continuation and is now the, is going to be the bride in, in the book of Revelation. 
And so that's what they say, and that's, what, and that's where this idea comes from. Now, notice God's promise, though, to, to Israel, Jeremiah chapter 3, in verse 1. They say, if a man put away his wife, and she go from him, and become another man's, shall he, shall he return unto her again, shall not the land. Notice the land. Every passage we're going to look at, he, he brings up the people and the land. Shall not the land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. Notice what he says there. Yet return again to me, saith the Lord. Isaiah chapter 54. We read this passage just a moment ago. Isaiah chapter 54. And verse 6. And the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth. When thou wast refused, saith thy God, for a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with great mercies will I, what? Gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have, I will have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. See, there are some promises and some covenants that God made with that nation, made with, with the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that they were going to be a, his people, and they were going to inherit a land, and they were, going to, they were going to be a kingdom, a kingdom people on the earth. And he was the one who was going to be faithful in that covenant. They're unfaithful. God's going to fix that. And that's what the new covenant's about, and that's why we see that in Jeremiah 31. But what you see there is God promised, it promises them, and you see that, that, that prophecy that he will, he will have mercy and kindness and then restore Israel. So there's this promise. So the idea that Israel uh, has been divorced and that God, and God has put them away and that he's going to have this new bride, and that is the church of today, is just totally false. It, it doesn't recognize God's promise and God's uh, covenants with the nation. Now, come with me to the book of Hosea. And you'll remember I, I mentioned that that passage there in 2 Kings chapter 17 from 14 to 18 covers the time where this book was written. And the book of Hosea demonstrates, God uses Hosea to, to demonstrate to the nation Israel uh, her adultery and why he divorced her and when that took place and so on. And Hosea there, who, who represents uh, Jehovah God, he takes to him a wife, Gomer. Interesting name for a lady. I keep thinking of Gomer Pyle. <laughs> she doesn't seem like a very pretty lady. But anyway, Hosea chapter 1. Now notice, notice verse 2. Hosea chapter 1 verse 2. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea, and the, and the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. Again, you see the issue of the land. Gomer represents the nation Israel, and she, and she commits adultery, and he's demonstrating that the nation has committed adultery with, with her lovers, all that idolatrous worship and that Baal worship. Now you come down and she has, she has several children there. Verse 4, And the Lord said unto him, Call his name Jezreel. He has a son, Jez Jezreel. For yet a little while, and I will avenge the blood of Jezreel upon the house of Jehu, and will cause the, uh, to cease the kingdom of the house of Israel. And she conceived, verse 6, And she conceived again. Now this child isn't Hosea's. And the next one isn't Hosea's. This is a child that she has with, with, with someone else. And she conceived again and, and bare a daughter, and God said unto him, Call her name lo for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. But I will have mercy upon the house of Judah, and will save them by the Lord their God, and will not save them by bow, nor by, by sword, nor by battle, by horses, nor by horsemen. Now when she had weaned lo she conceived and bare a son, and God said, Call his name lo for ye are not my people, and I will not be your God. So he, he demonstrates the nation Israel has, has abandoned God, hasn't walked in the, in, in, in the statutes and the commandments that God uh, gave them. She transgressed that marriage covenant. She commits adultery with, with, with Baal, and God says that uh, Gomer is going to represent the nation Israel, and her children are going to represent the people in that nation and what they mean to me. You have not obtained mercy, and you're not my people. Now, you come to chapter 2. 
And just about, it seems, when you read Hosea, he has kind of a, a dark message in the beginning, but then there's a promise of restoration. Notice chapter 2. And what I want you to see here in these passages is that God, even though he divorced Israel, has a plan in the future. You will see a remarriage. Now notice Hosea chapter 2, verse 16. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, that is, my husband, and shalt call me no more Balai. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground, and I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth, and I will make them to lie down safely. In Scripture, you'll read about the covenant of peace, and that is this covenant where, where God causes the nation to, to, to live in their land safely. Now, verse 19 and I will betroth thee unto me for how long? Forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. So who's the faithful one in the relationship? It's Jehovah God. And see what, he, what he's going to do there. And, and the new covenant is going to be the basis for this. I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness. He's going to cleanse them. He's going to make them right. And in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. Verse 20, I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness. And thou shalt know the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day, I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens and they shall hear the earth. And the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil and they shall hear Jezreel. And I will, now notice this point, notice this verse. And, and grab, while you're reading that, noticing that, grab Isaiah 62. And I will show her. Unto me, where? In the earth. And I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, thou art my people. And they shall say, thou art my God. What a wonderful promise. And he says there, I will sow her in, uh, unto me in the earth. There is a place where God is going to plant Israel. There is a land that he promised Abraham that he's going to take the nation and plant them as he promised. And they're going to dwell there and live there safely and attend to the things of the Lord and serve God in righteousness and peace. Now, two passages. 1 Peter chapter 2 and Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62 and 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, Isaiah 62 is an important passage. Turn with me, though, first to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 10. Now, look at 1 Peter 2. I'm going to going to read something to you. I lost my place there in Hosea, but at the end of Hosea chapter 2, remember that the two children, Loamai and, and Loruhamah, you have not obtained mercy and you're not my people. Notice he says there, uh, ver chapter 2, verse 23, and I will have mercy upon her that had not, uh, had not obtained mercy, and I will say to them which were not my people, thou art my people. First Peter 2, and notice what, what Peter writes here to the, the little flock. And verse 9, First Peter 2, verse 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Now, isn't that what he said to, to Israel back in Exodus, where he says, I will make thee a kingdom of priests? You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into, this marvelous, into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So who is Hosea chapter 2 referring to? The ones, the, the, the group of people that he's going to plant in the earth. He's talking about that royal priesthood and that kingdom, that, the kingdom of priests. He's talking about believing Israel. And he makes a promise that I'm going to restore you. And under the, the, the covenants and, and the new covenant that's going to be the basis of, by which you, you dwell in that land and so on, uh, in, in righteousness, I'm going to make you right and I'm going to cause you to walk after my law and my statutes and write that in your heart. 
He's talking about the believing nation, that little flock. Now, Isaiah chapter 62. Isaiah chapter 62, verse 1. And for me, this passage just puts kind of all of it together. Isaiah 62, verse 1. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake will I not rest, until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all the kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. When, when I married my wife, she took on a new name. They're going to take on a new name. Thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. He's got, they're going to be the crowning jewel. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah and thy land Beulah for the Lord. Now, here's what Hephzibah means. For thy Lord delighteth in thee, and here's what Beulah is, and thy land shall be married. Verse 5, for as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. And there you see God, there, there's the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who, that's who it is. And he's going to marry that nation and he's going to take the people and they're going to be married to the land. He's going to sow them into the land like he said in Hosea chapter 2. And he's going to marry them and they're going to be married to their land. Because when, remember, Israel was taken out of the land. He divorced them, and they were taken into captivity. But there are some covenants and, 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 and some promises that God made to the nation that he's, go, that he's faithful in and that he's going to perform. And here we see that promise of, of that restoration. I'm going to, you're going to be married. Now, come with me to Hebrews chapter 11. And 2 Chronicles chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And Hebrews chapter 11. 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 7. Here we read, Are not thou our God who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before the people Israel... Now, here's what I want you to notice, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 7, and gavest, gavest it to thy seed, to the seed of Abraham, thy friend, for how long? Forever. He says, there's some land that I gave to Abraham, that I promised Abraham forever, and to his seed. Now, Hebrews chapter 11, and notice verse 8. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. You remember, of course, Genesis chapter 12. And he went out, not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a, what? A city, which hath foundations, plural whose builder and maker is God. Here's a city that God has made with foundations that, was, that Abraham was looking for. Now notice, come down with me to verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that uh, say such things declare, declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is unheavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Now, what's interesting is when you read back in Genesis chapter 12, you don't read about this city. You don't read about this, this country, per se. You talk about a land. But see, Abraham knew more than what was just recorded back there in Genesis. He was looking for a country and a city whose builder and maker is God and it has foundations. And we're going to read in Revelation 21, that's the city he's looking for, that new Jerusalem. 
Notice Hebrews, you're there in the book of Hebrews. Come with me to chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13, notice verse 14. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. See, that's, that's their hope. When God is going to take the nation and he's going to put them in their land, in righteousness, where they will dwell in that land and in that country and in that city. That's their hope. That's what Abraham was looking for. That's the Abrahamic covenant. Now, for time's sake, I'm just going to refer to a couple things. Come with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. You remember, of course, the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12 and 15, 17 talks about that and gives the details of it where he says, I'm going to take you out of this land. I'm going to, I promise you a land. I'm going to give you a seed uh, innumerable and you're going to have a people and so on and so forth. And you remember the Palestinian covenant there and, and you'll see that in Deuteronomy where God gives them this land. So there's going to be a people, there's going to be a land. And then you see the Davidic covenant that he makes with, with his servant David, the king, and he says, I'm going to establish your throne in the earth forever. And then you see that new covenant that's going to cause them to walk in a way that pleases God. They're going to have his, his law and his ju judgments and statutes written in their heart, and they're going to serve him in righteousness. And all of those covenants fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ, he's, he's the one who's faithful to make that happen. It has nothing to do with Israel, what Israel could do for God, and that's what that old covenant demonstrated, that they were going to fail under that law. That law was their schoolmaster to point to the one that they needed to depend, depend on. Now, with all those covenants, you'll see that, that culminating point there in that new heaven, that new earth. Math, now, notice Matthew chapter 5 and verse 35. Verse 34. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And we learn about Jerusalem, and that's the city of the great king. We see that new Jerusalem coming down, that, that throne of God coming down to, to earth. And it's, he described it, he's, it's that city. It's that tabernacle. It's that throne of God coming to earth. And that's where the Lord Jesus Christ will reign. Now, Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1 and verse 68. Abraham, he was looking for a heavenly country, a heavenly land, a heavenly city. And it's called the New Jerusalem. That's going to, it's literally going to sit upon the, that geographical location that we know as Jerusalem, that, that, that landmass that was promised. Luke chapter 1, verse, I'll begin in 67 there. And this is Zacharias here, and, and the birth of John the Baptist takes place, and he speaks. And his father, Zacharias, uh, verse 67, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And he spake, as he spake, by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. This is something that's been prophesied and something that, that they knew about according to prophecy. Verse 71, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And you see there that the Lord Jesus Christ came, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. And that is their husband's name, is it not? Isaiah chapter 54 and so on. So come with me now to Revelation 21. We know who the bridegroom is. John chapter 3, verse 29, he says, The bride is for the bridegroom. He says, The friend of the bridegroom rejoiceth. That's John the Baptist. The, the bridegroom is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that bride is that believing people, that believing remnant, that royal priesthood. Come with me to Revelation 21 and verse, verse 9. Now, 
in prophecy, we saw that the wife, the wife of God, God's wife, that terminology used, and again, that's figure of speech. Peter, James, and John are not going to refer to themselves in the kingdom as, hey, I'm the Lord's wife. Don't you know I'm married to Jesus Christ? It's not an individual thing. When he talks about the individuals, he talks about the children of the bride, Matthew chapter 9. When he talks about the bride, he's talking about that commonwealth, that nation. Now, Revelation chapter 21, verse 9 I, he says, come hither, the end of verse 9, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, that holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. There's that heavenly city that we read about in Hebrews 11. Having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now, let me stop there and just connect something for you. A lot of times when, and this was a question that I had, how come in prophecy we read about God's wife being Israel? That's who he was married to. He divorced them. He promises remarriage. He promises a gathering. He promised, promises, like Hosea chapter 2, that I'm going to sow her unto me in the land. And then when he shows the bride here in Revelation 21, he shows a city. He doesn't show a people. He doesn't show, he doesn't show Israel. He shows a city. Well, there are people that live in that city that royal priesthood. And what you're going to see in a moment is that that city is known as the tabernacle of God. He is the temple. He is the tabernacle. And where do priests serve God? In that temple. This temple doesn't have a veil, by the way. You see that? We'll, we'll, as we'll read on. But when John sees a city, he sees that culminating representation of, of all that God promised Israel coming down to earth in their land forever. That whole city represents the righteous character and conduct of the people and their God coming down to earth in a land forever that they can serve him without fear and in righteousness, just like was talked about in Luke chapter 1. So when he talks about a city, now we look at, we're going to look at the dimensions of the city. When John sees the city, what else is he going to see? The city is huge. Remember, Revelation is, is, is demonstrating for you and is teaching you a fulfillment of something that was talked about in prophecy. Now you continue reading there, verse 11. Having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. So the first thing we learn about this city is that there's this light, clear as crystal. Now, he, he says, like a jasper stone. And I look up jasper stones, they usually look red or something like that. But he says, it's clear as crystal. It's pure. It's a pure, bright, white light. And it had a wall great and high and had 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and names written thereon and uh, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So there in, in verse 11 we see a, a, a white, uh, a clear as crystal light, a, a strong white light. Uh, verse 12 we have 12 angels at 12 gates with the, with the names of the 12 tribes written upon them. There are three gates on each side of, of, of the wall. So you have three gates on the north side, on the south side, on the, on the west side, east side. Verse 13, as he talks about this wall, or verse 14 rather, there are 12 foundations, and, I, and written upon them are the names of the 12 apostles. And those 12 apostles, as Matthew 19 talks about, they're going to be the, the, those 12 judges, those 12 princes talked about in prophecy in the book of Numbers and so on, and they're going to sit upon 12 thrones and judge the 12 uh, tribes of Israel. You come down to verse 15 and 16, and he talks about the length and the breadth and the height. 12,000 furlongs, he says. You'll notice there verse, verse 15, and he and he, uh, he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof. And the city lieth four square and the light is as, uh, uh, and the length is as large as the breadth and then measured the city with the reed. 12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. Now, a furlong is an eighth of a mile. You have 12,000. You divide that by eight and you come up with 1,500. You have 1,500 miles so this city is 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles broad, the breadth of it, 
and it's 1,500 miles high. Now, it's no wonder it needs 12 foundations. Just to give you an idea, if you were to travel and look on a map and travel from Bangor, Maine, all the way to Key Largo, Florida, that's just about the whole east coast of the U.S., that's how long it is. Now, there's the breadth of it. Now, take that, take that east coast of the U.S. and stand it up on its head, and that's how tall it is. You can't even think about that. The tallest building in the world is in Dubai, India, and that's 2,700 feet. It's 1,500 miles high. Outer space, when you study something like this, you look up stupid things on the internet like how far is outer space from the Earth's surface? It's 100 kilometers, 62 miles, 380,000 feet. That's outer space with all the satellites. So if I wanted to travel to outer space, I only have to go 62 miles. That's it? This thing is 1,500 miles tall. It's a remarkable city. Now, verse 17, he talks about the wall. As he measured the wall, there of 140 and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. Now, I find it curious that he writes it that way. He says, of a man, that is, of the angel. Now, we know that angels, when they appear, they appear as men. They're men. They're not men, they're angels, but they look like men. They look like large men. You read uh, Ezekiel chapter 40, I believe, he talks about when the angel's measuring the temple there, he says it's a cubit, which is 18 inches roughly, right? And a hand breadth, and that's another four inches. So it's 22 inches. So if you're going to measure it from 18 inches, a cubit, a human cubit, or that of an angel, which I personally think would be around 22, a little, little bit bigger, you have approximately 260 feet high to 264 feet high of a wall. Now you say, well, we got buildings that, that big, and we can imagine that. But think about that. That wall, that 260-foot wall, is 1,500 miles around. It's huge. Now this gets fun. And the building of the wall, verse 18, of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold. Now notice, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, uh, the... Uh, the, the sixth, uh, Sardis, the seventh, Chrysolite, the eighth, Beryl, the ninth, uh, Topaz, the tenth, a uh, Chrysosprosis, the eleventh, a Jacinth, the twelve, an Amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, and it, as it were, transparent glass. So I have all these precious stones that represent the 12 tribes of the nation Israel. And you remember Aaron, when he had that breastplate that, uh, on that ephod, he had, uh, he had 12 stones, right? And they represented the 12 tribes of the nation Israel. You read back there in Isaiah 14 or Ezekiel 28, Lucifer had stones that covered him. He was covered in stones, these precious stones, and he's got about 10 or 9 out of 12 of them. And you have, you have here all these precious stones covering, though the city is as clear glass, and you have a bright white light shining from within, and that's the light of the glory of God. Come with me to Ezekiel chapter 1. Notice the, the physical manifestation of this city and its light. Notice what, what it looks like. What did I tell you? Thank you. I forgot. Ezekiel chapter 1, and notice verse 28. And we're going to see a description of the throne room of God. And that's what's coming down to earth. Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 27, or verse 20, 26. And above the firmament that was over their heads, talking about the, the cherubim there, was, was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of a throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man up above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of, of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. And as the appearance of, now notice verse 28, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. He's talking about a rainbow. So when you have a bright white light 
and it shines and it goes through a, a prism. What happens? That light bends and it refracts and you have that rainbow, that multicolored uh, uh, image like a rainbow. And a lot of times if you look up images of the New Jerusalem, which would be kind of silly to do, who, who's ever seen it? Well, here's someone who has. Revelation talks about it. What you see, you have this almost this crystal-like city coming down with the glory of God in it, shining forth, and it has this rainbow effect. All these pictures, it's this big gold block that comes down. I don't know if it's a cube or if it's a pyramid. There's debate about that. There's verses I, that personally I would believe it's more like a pyramid. And you thought Pink Floyd was the only one who ever came up with that. See, some of you know, okay. Dark side of the moon, and he's got that, that prism and the light going forth. That's just some counterfeit picture and image of what's really going to happen there. You're going to have the city of God come down. It's going to be clear as glass. It's going to be this beautiful, beautiful city. And when you look at that city, you're going to say, whose builder and maker is God. Now, time-wise, I'm already past due, but if you will just allow me a few minutes, and I want to address that third point, why the body of Christ is not the bride of Christ. When you look at that city, that glorious city, and it, look at what it has associated with it. Twelve, twelve gates, twelve names, the names of the twelve apostles, twelve foundations, twelve stones, associated with the twelve tribes of the nation Israel. Who do you think it's about? Israel. And that's clear. The word of God is simple. The hard part is people get denominationalism and religion, get a chokehold on somebody, and it, it gets in the way and it distracts from believing the truth. The word of God is simple. The wife is, is referred to in prophecy as the nation Israel. And when you see there in prophecy that fulfillment there, you see that, that glorious city where the priests of God are going to be serving the Lord Jesus Christ, their king, in righteousness and peace. And it's totally associated with the nation Israel. Now, there are three passages that Christianity uses to make the body the bride. Uh, Romans 7, and if you will, turn with me to Romans 7. And I'm just going to touch on a couple of these very quickly, and we'll focus the rest of our time there on Ephesians 5, which is probably the main passage, and then we'll close. And I'm just going to make some quick comments about this, this so you could see. Romans chapter 7, and notice verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. And so people say, well, there we are, the bride of Christ. We're married to him. Now, again, the context of the passage there, he talks about the woman and the husband, and he gives that picture, and he says, you are married to Christ. And that verse, just let that verse stand. That's okay. But notice, you're already married. You're not waiting for a future marriage, and, you're, and it's not a remarriage. What he's talking about is you've been joined. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. First Corinthians chapter 6 talks about you are joined to the Lord. You are one with him. You have his life. You are dead to the law. You're alive unto God. And that's his point there. But for argument's sake, just notice you're already married. This isn't a future event that's going to take place. You're already joined to Christ. We use terminology like, you know, How's the job going? Well, I'm married to it. We bicker and we fight a lot. Mondays are always bad. <laughs> Second Corinthians 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Here's another popular passage, and I wish we had the time to go into the details, but you could spend time looking at this, and if you just let the truth stand, it's very clear. This just doesn't fit. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, he says, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now notice the word as. And if you read down through the passage, verse 3, As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. He wants you to be pure, undefiled in the doctrine and in the understanding. If someone's preaching another gospel, reject it. If someone's preaching another Jesus, reject it. That's what he's talking about there. But again, you notice you're already married. And it's as a chaste virgin. He's giving you a picture. It's not a status. Ephesians chapter 5. 
And if you read through that context of the passage, you know what he's talking about. He's talking about your minds being corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ and what to look out for and, and, and how to be careful and not, not to associate yourselves with, with, with that false doctrine. Ephesians chapter 5. Now, here's the passage, and I'm just going to point out three things briefly, and then we'll close. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. He says here, Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, you come down to verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. And people take that passage and they say, see, the body of Christ is the bride of Christ. And there's the passage that describes that. Now, three things. The man and wife are already man and wife in that passage. Again, it's not a future event. It's not a future occurrence. It's not a remarriage. He's talking about the relationship between husband and wife. Secondly, he says there in, in the, at the end of the passage, I speak, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. God in his relationship with Israel, as we read there in, in uh, Luke chapter 1, was spoken by the prophets since the world began the formation, the creation of the body of Christ and Christ and his body was a mystery and you never learn anything about that until you come to Paul. That marriage in Revelation 21 will happen. That would happen if, if the body never came into existence is what I want you to understand. He says this is a great mystery. This isn't something according to prophecy. This is something, he talks about church and Christ and the church. That's a mystery. And the third point is that everyone takes this passage and they get it inverted. They turn it up on its head. Your marriage with your spouse is not a representation of Christ and the church. Now, notice he never talks about Christ and the bride. You can never find that here in this passage. It's you and your bride. It's you and your spouse. And you and your spouse are not a picture of Christ and the church. Rather, Christ and the church, his relationship with the body, him loving the church and giving himself for the church, that's the representation, that's the, the picture, that's what you need to learn from in your marriage. Everyone takes it and flips it on its head and says, see, we're a picture of Christ in the church. Well, God forbid. Christ doesn't bicker and fight and, and, and you know, get aggravated with his people because you're at peace with God. It's always, it, people turn it on its head. It's backwards. Christ and, and the relationship that he has with his body is a picture of you and your bride, not his bride. Now, let me give you six reasons. Write these down, and we're going to close again. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right. <laughs> six reasons why I believe people, the mistake that they make, in making the, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. One, they don't rightly divide. If they rightly divided the word of truth, they would understand God's purpose in the mystery and God's purpose in prophecy. They would understand that the body of Christ is something totally different and that is not, Israel and the body are not one. We'll get, we'll get to that. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 15 says, Study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Second reason is people want to make the church, the body of Christ, begin at pe Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. But we learn about the beginning of the church there in, in Paul's revelation, uh, Ephesians chapter 3. And you'll see there he says, he talks about the dispensation of the grace of God which was given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, 
whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And they'll say, see, Israel and, and, and the body of Christ, those Gentiles, they're going to be one. That's not what the passage says. You can't have the body of Christ unless Israel has fallen. Israel is disqualified, as it were, from, from God's dealings. They have been set aside. They have been, they have been uh, put to the side. God is not dealing with the nation Israel. They have a future hope. They have a future glory, and it's not yours. It's not mine. I'm the part of the body of Christ, and, that, and he talks about that. He says that's a mystery. Now, point number three is Christianity at large want to be Israel. They want to take the blessings, they, and they... I mean, you see it in their prayer life. You see it in everything in Christianity. They want to they counterfeit Israel. They want to be Israel. And Romans chapter 11, verse 25 says, I would have you not be ignorant, brethren, unless you be wise in your own conceits. And when we're conceited, you know what we do? We start our stuff, we look in the mirror, and we say, hey. You know what? You think you're somebody else. And see, when you get married, and then they tell you, no, you're not. You look terrible. That shirt has a stain on it. Change it. They want to be Israel. He says, don't be conceited. You're not Israel. Is blindness in part has happened to Israel uh, uh, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Fourth reason, we just kind of touched on this. They want to make Israel and the body of Christ equal. They want to make it one. He's not talking about Israel and the body being one. He's talking about Jew and Gentile being made one uh, in one flesh, there is no difference in the body of Christ. He says, well, you're Jew or Gentile, bound or free, so on and so forth. There is no distinction. And you better believe there's a distinction in that kingdom between an Israelite, God's priests, and, and those nations. Five, they say our destiny is on earth. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10 talks about God's eternal purpose for heaven and earth. And how he's going, he has made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. And we are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with him. Our hope, he says, is laid up in heaven. Colossians chapter, Colossians chapter 1. People say, we're going to reign on earth in that new Jerusalem. No, you're not. You're going to fulfill God's eternal purpose in glorifying and exalting his son in the heavenly places where he has seated you. The verses on that is Ephesians 1.10, Ephesians 2.6, Colossians 1.5, and 1 Thessalonians 4.17. And the last point, and I think this is rather serious, it's failure to recognize Israel's hope. God is not finished with the nation Israel. The gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. He promised to regather them. He promised to remarry them. He promised to sow them back into their land, to marry them, to have a faithful union with them, a loving uh, union in, in mercy and loving kindness and in righteousness never to be separated. And again, when you don't rightly divide the word of truth and you don't rightly divide between prophecy, what was prophesied since the world began and what was kept secret since the world began, you take things that don't belong to you. And you come, come away not appreciating God's eternal purpose for heaven and earth to glorify his son. Now, Paul says, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given me, if you need to recognize Paul's message to understand this, Understanding the message and the ministry given to Paul, when you understand that, you understand God's ultimate plan for heaven and earth. How we relate in exalting the Lord Jesus Christ in the heavenly places and how Israel and their kingdom are going to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ on the earth in that land that was promised. And what you realize is the mystery, the revelation of the mystery, well, just the, the best thing ever, is the secret to understanding your Bible. Father, we thank you for your word, just the, the intrigue that it has, the, the knowledge that we gain from it when we study it the way you teach us how to study it. And I just pray that as we walk away today, we understand fully more and, uh, and appreciate more your plan and purpose for heaven and earth to exalt your son. And, and Father, may your son be the, the very focus um, of our heart to glorify him and all that we do and say for your honor and your glory because of who you have made us in your son. Amen.